The title of tonight's session is The Fulcrum of the Entire Universe. And it's deliberately intended to throw you a little off balance here. And of course, we also call it the pivot of all history. And uh, we're talking about Isaiah 53. We're spending our second session just on this particular portion of Scripture for some very good reasons, we believe. And so it's also going to be part of our commentary on Isaiah. It'll be end up being session 20 of 24, basically, on the whole book of Isaiah. But we felt this is so important, we are publishing it as a separate package itself. Now, as you may remember, Isaiah is designed into two units, if you will. Uh, from chapters 1 through uh, 39 is eight, what we call unit 1. And from 40 on, it's very different in style and in focus. So uh, from 40 to 48, it's the purpose of peace. From 49 to 57, the prince of peace. And from 58 to 66, the program of peace. These are just partitions that the text seems to lend itself to. We notice the first two have a phrase that sort of ties off their sessions. There is no peace, saith Yorivave, to the wicked. And that little phrase ties off both those first two sessions. But the interesting thing is in the second major session, we encounter a very special chapter. It's chapter 53. In fact, we notice that it is exactly in the middle of the, the second unit of Isaiah. It, there's 13 chapters from the beginning and 13 chapters to the end. I mention this, it's not that it's you know, uh, theolo theologically important, except it tends to underscore our hermeneutics. Um, uh, the hermeneutics is the theory of interpretation. And we, take, we have a very high view. We believe that every detail of the sacred text is there by deliberate design. So when we observe, make these observations, we're, we're uh, um, accepting the idea that these are deliberate designs. And so Isaiah 53, the fulcrum of the entire universe, the pivot of all history, and it's well known as the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. You'll find that in many expositions. One can make the representation that a summary of the entire New Testament is in these 12 verses. And that's rather flabbergasting when you think that through. That remark isn't made casually. It's a result of a great deal of study, and that is our view. Now, the scope of Isaiah 53 is uh, uh, the thing that I'm trying to emphasize with these titles and so forth is the entire creation is involved. We tend to focus on this in terms of our personal redemption, and indeed we should. In fact, we are devoting two sessions to Isaiah 53. In the previous session when we were together, we focused primarily on the personal devotional aspect of Isaiah 53. But we're indulging in a second session on the same chapter from a different point of view. To recognize the scope of the passage isn't just us. It's the entire creation. And uh, I want to get, try to get that across. Many of us that have a background in physics and information sciences, we suspect that entropy, the concept of randomness, was introduced in Genesis 3 as part of God's curse. If you look at the uh, idiomatic translation of the New Testament by uh, William Graham MacDonald, he encode, it takes uh, Romans 8.20 with a slightly different flavor that I, we think is right on the mark. In Romans 8.20, Paul says, The creation was subjected to entropy, not by consent, but on account of the one who subjected it so as to involve hope. So the entire creation is the subject of God's curse, not just mankind is the point. And therefore, the entire creation is the beneficiary of what occurred on that cross that was erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. And so the next verse, taking right just out of the King James in this case, Paul says, because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. You see what Paul's saying? He's emphasizing that the completed work of Jesus Christ as represented by the cross involves more than you and me. It involves the creation itself. And uh, 
it, it's the, it, the, this is all a result of the of God's declaration of war against Satan in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. This is the climax. That was the first hint and this is the punctuation point if you will. The bondage of corruption is the way it shows up in your King James. The bondage of corruption is an, a way of expressing what we call today entropy. The, t the general tendency in the direction of randomness. And it's important to understand that because that particular concept is undermining our entire culture. The idea of the design happens by chance. That's a contradiction in terms. Entropy, the basic definition in the information science, randomness or entropy is the absence of design. To attribute design to randomness is a demonstration they don't even know what those words mean because they're both antithetical to each other. And it's very fundamental. To ascribe the most elegant designs to the result of randomness or entropy is the definitive absurdity. There's nothing in language that is more absurd than that particular statement. And it demonstrates a total lack of understanding of these very meaning of these terms and yet we let our children in school get taught that they are the results of a cosmic accident. And then we wonder why they have no sense of destiny. We've disconnected character and destiny by so doing and then we wonder why we have these, these bizarre uh, events occur in our culture. Design or information, those are synonymous from our point of view, is often designated as negative entropy. And it astonishes me, astonishes me by the way, that some of the most brilliant spring theorists mess that up. They get those confused. Entropy and its opposite, negative entropy. But anyway, let's move on here. Our real focus here is the divine conflict. And this is the conflict. We know that Satan fell and he took a host of angels with him. From Revelation 12 we infer there about a third of the angels apparently went with him in his, in his rebellion. And history is, the, its primary plot is Satan's opposition to God. You can study your Bible from Genesis chapter 3 to Revelation 22 as a drama of Satan trying to undo or upset or thwart or somehow confuse God's plan. And it's part of the drama. Once you understand that drama, it's one of the most fantastic plots and dramas you can imagine because God always uh, makes Satan look rather foolish. It's, kind of, it's, it's actually quite fun. In fact, this whole thing is summarized. It, the, the amazing thing about the war that God declared in Genesis 3 is the central role in that war is humankind, you and me. We'll take a summary of it we find in Deuteronomy 4, verse 32, where God says, For ask now of the days that are past, which were before thee, since the day that God created man upon the earth, and ask from one side of heaven to the other whether there hath been any such thing as this great thing is or hath been heard like it. God is here highlighting the uniqueness of the drama that's in front of us. The covenant that God declares is unique to the earth. It's exclusive to humans and it's universally unprecedented. There's nothing like it that preceded or that will follow it in the entire universe. And, it, and the theater for that drama is the planet Earth. It's not on Mars or other place, it's here. And we'll talk a little bit about that. See, there, 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 this would seem to embrace any targets of the so-called astrobiologists. One of the popular things right now is to talk about astrobiology, the study of life outside the Earth. And the problem with that, that's not a science, there's no evidence of it. They haven't been able to find any evidence to study. Science is a study of evidence. There is no science of astrobiology because there's no evidence. Okay, so we need to understand that. And you can ask from one side of heaven to the other, this language clearly goes beyond the planet Earth. It goes to the entire creation. And so you ask, is there, is there life in outer space? I have a simple question, is it sinless or is it sinful? Either answer comes out zero. You don't have sinless out there and you don't have sinful that hasn't been paid for by Christ. So you got a dilemma right up front. It shows that you don't really understand what God is doing here. The messianic achievement we're going to center on tonight is the incarnation of Jesus Christ as our Savior 
who is delivered via Israel, and that He is universal. He's not just for the Jews, He's for all of us. That was the mechanic that God used to bring it, bring it, His plan into program. But the covenant is unique to the earth, exclusive to humans, and universally unprecedented is my point. The most compelling argument for the uniqueness of terrestrial life on the planet earth is the incarnation of the Creator Himself. The Creator that made it all chose to become a creation in that, and enter that creation, and He did it here, nowhere else, uniquely, once and for all. So, and that's in John 1, Colossians 1, Hebrews 1, the opening chapters, verses of John, Colossians, and Hebrews focus on this very point, so you can follow that out on your own. And he, the other thing to understand, Jesus did not become a man for 33 and a half years. The astonishing thing that we discover is that as we meet here tonight, there is a man sitting on the throne of God. And that's staggering in its implications. And we could spend the whole hour on that one if we want to. We're going to keep moving here. See, there's a frustration of astrobiology you should anticipate here. See, there's nothing but bad news for the astrobiologists, because you don't want to confuse wishful thinking with evidence. And, uh, and don't be surprised if astrobiology uh, develops the same ethics that paleontology or climatology has, which is pretty dismal. Science is a study of evidence, and astrobiology hasn't found any evidence to study. And despite extensive searching, there isn't any evidence of life beyond the, the planet Earth. This science has yet to demonstrate that, it is a, that its subject matter even exists. This isn't science, it's called priesthood. We need to understand that what, what we used to call science generations ago was the search for truth. But our culture has decided there is no truth, we've explained truth away, it's relative. That's nonsense. And so what we now have, what we call science, is really a priesthood. If you don't adhere to the, to the credo of that, you, you jeopardize your career. And that's a whole other thing we can talk about if you like. And so, there is a principle that's been observed in secular science called the Anthropic Principle. The Anthropic Principle has cataloged over 140 quantifiable characteristics, each of which was fall within extremely narrow ranges for physical life to exist. If you try to make a model of what we know about the universe, we discover that there are ratios in that model that if you change some of them as little as one part in a million, life is impossible. They're skillfully tuned to make life exist. Not just a few, he's found over 140 of those. And you need to understand the significance. That implies not only very skillful design, but also very diligent maintenance to keep it going. In fact, there's over 400 quantifiable characteristics for advanced life to exist. Now the real point is, when you recognize that many of these factors require a precision of less than one part in a million, their composite effect constitutes a very good definition of what you would call a miracle. And that's what life is. All life on the earth came from the same source, all life on the earth is tied to that same source, and it's unique in the universe. So this pivotal passage then uh, describes the astonishing personal sacrifice of the Creator Himself to accrue a benefit to you and me. That's why it's the fulcrum or pivot of the entire cosmic uh, drama. This passage that we're studying was so disturbing to the Ashkenazi Jews, they removed it out of their Bible. However, the Sephardic Jews, the other half of them, kept it in theirs, and fortunately in, in 1947 when we discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, we, that included a complete copy of Isaiah, and chapter 53 was right there in the middle where it belonged. So we should, to the, somewhat to the embarrassment of those that didn't understand. The book of Isaiah is in 66 chapters in two groups, chapters 1 through 39 and chapters 40 through 66. Both the style and the theme are demonstrably intensified in the second section. And Isaiah 53 is precisely in the middle of that second session, with 13 chapters on either side. And by the way, any of you who don't know that it was the same Isaiah that wrote both sections haven't discovered John chapter 12. 
because there's a passage in there, John 12, verse 37 to 41, in which the same Isaiah is quoted from Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 53, and it, the Holy Spirit has put that there to save you hours of boring library research, chasing down these silly, erroneous conjectures that, that uh, litter the, the landscape. No, the one Isaiah, and that's clearly what the Bible, uh, and the serious expositors recognize right up front. It was written about 700 B.C., this passage we're talking about, and it's mentioned in all four Gospels. This is not a, we're not in a little by-roads here, we're right in the centroid of the study. And you'll find it in all four Gospels, and you'll also find it in Acts, Romans, and Peter, and other references. So, it incidentally was this very passage that confused the Ethiopian treasurer. He was on his way home from Jerusalem, confused, and God went to supernatural uh, uh, means to get Philip out of the revival in Samaria, down to the Gaza Road, and encounter him, and uh, straighten this out for him. It's all recorded in Acts chapter 8. And we think there's a link between that whole event and the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, and that's a whole other study that we went into. But the important part, this passage details the crucifixion, which is remarkable, especially since this was recorded 700 years before crucifixion was invented. The form of, uh, of capital punishment in Israel was stoning. And here we have a description of the Messiah who's going to be executed by crucifixion seven centuries before it's even invented. That it should catch your attention here. And so, uh, if it, uh, crucifixion was invented by the Persians and widely adopted by the Romans. If you want to study the crucifixion, of course, you usually come right here to Isaiah 53, where the Lamb is slain in our place. You also want to read Psalm 22, which it reads as if it was dictated by Christ as He hung on the cross. Astonishing passage, describing the bones, the thirst, the piercing of the hands and feet, the humiliation, the ridicule, and the casting of lots for His clothes. And His first and last words are there uh, alluded to while He hung on the cross. When you look at Zechariah 12:10 and some of the passages that deal with the second coming of the Messiah, in Zechariah 12, 10 is an example. Jesus says, they shall look upon me, the Alpha, the, the Alpha and the Tau, whom they have pierced. And you miss that Alpha and Tau because that's an untranslated part of the Hebrew text. But that, if you put it in, in, in uh, Greek, it, they look upon me, the Alpha and the Omega, whom they pierced. In other words, it's a way of saying the first and the last. And uh, as, some, as you study eschatology, you find it is also, the entire thing hangs on this pivot point. Isaiah 53, and it all starts, and Isaiah 53 starts two verses early, by the way. Those chapter divisions are man's division. They, they were done in the 14th or 15th century, by the way. And so, so the eschatological rebuttal is a very interesting one. The second coming itself is a rebuttal to any eschatological role for any life beyond the planet Earth. You're going to be hearing a lot about uh, UFOs and life on other planets. There's a fixation about that in our culture. You need to understand that the second coming of Christ is a rebuttal to all that. Yes, there's a gigantic delusion coming, and that's a subject for another study. But realize that the eschatological passages in the Bible also underscore the uniqueness of life on the earth. And so, in fact, by the way, there's even a, a, a real sense in which this passage, Isaiah 53, is actually predictive events that haven't happened yet. Because what it's really describing is when the nation Israel discovers that Messiah all along was their Messiah. That's yet to happen. And that's coming. That's the prerequisite to the second coming according to Hosea 5.15. But we'll move on here. I always get fascinated by some of these quaint perceptions that the rabbis have. We can learn a lot from them. The rabbis say when the Messiah comes, he will not only interpret the words, the letters, he'll even interpret the spaces between the letters. <laughs> and when I first heard that, I discarded that as sort of one of these colorful exaggerations. But I have to tell you, after tonight, I think you'll agree with me that they may be on to something here that is yet to really be understood. Amen. We're going to encounter, I just want to prepare yourself. I'm not sure we had seat belts for all the seats in here, but you want to fasten your seat belts because the ride you're about to get into is not for everybody, but I think you'll find it an enjoyable one. Jesus warned you about this in Matthew 5:18. 
Jesus said, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yard or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now, that may not mean much to us unless you've studied Hebrew, but a yacht or a tittle is a Hebraism. The, the, a yacht is one of the, it's the smallest of the 22 Hebrew letters in their alphabet. You and I would mistake it for a little apostrophe or a little blemish on the paper. That's what a yacht is in the, in the alphabet. A tittle are the little hooks on some of the Hebrew letters that allow you to distinguish the letter, if you will. Saying a yacht or a tittle would be the same as you and I saying, not the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T shall pass. It's Jesus' way of telling you to take the text seriously. These people that build their theologies on allegories and fanciful twisting of the text are really playing with fire. Because Jesus' instruction, He gave us a, a hermeneutic instruction right here. That note every yacht and tittle is critical. So I move to the direction of arguing there are no synonyms. Two words may mean almost the same thing, but watch out for that almost. Develop a respect for precision in your Bible studies. And in today's world with modern software, you can study the Hebrew and the Greek without knowing Hebrew or Greek because of the exegetical and expositional resources that are available for free on the internet. Do your homework. So uh, that's the, the yacht and the tittle are terms that you should get comfortable with. That leads, by the way, something you should have a perspective of. And that's the history of cryptography, the study of secret writing. One of the things you need to understand, it actually a lot of the techniques today in cryptography derive from the ancient Hebrew linguistics of the ancient sages. See, Hebrew is a very strange alphabet. It's the shortest of all of them. It's only 22 letters, not 26 like English, okay? It also has no vowels. Vowels tend to be redundant. And if you're going to encrypt a secret message, you get rid of the redundancy to make it non-redundant. So one of the first things you do if you're doing an encryption is you throw away the vowels, put them in later. You find you, over about 65% of English is, are vowels. They, they, they're not essential, strangely enough. Okay. The other thing you discover about the Hebrew alphabet, it is not just a phoneme. We're used to alphabets in which each letter portrays a way you pronounce the word. When we learn the alphabet, we learn how pretty much to pronounce, we, we learn there's exceptions, but we, we learned how to pronounce words. Those are phonemes, they, they're how they sound. Hebrew is not just phonetic. Hebrew is semimic. That means each letter carries meaning. In fact, the Hebrew department of the University of Phoenix um, has told, pointed out to me that if they teach the kids how the Hebrew letters were originally written, they turn out to be able to read about 80% of Hebrew. They learn what the letters mean, because all Hebrew words are built on a three-letter root. And if you get those three letters, you can get the root and get a, a sense of what the word means. And the prefix and suffix, you know, modify that a little bit. And you should understand that uh, Moses and David wrote, a, wrote Hebrew letters in a very different ones than the way they write today. This square form that we're used to in the Hebrew of today really came out of, uh, out of the Babylonian captivity from the Aramaic script. And uh, they were easier to write. And they, and, uh, but they be gradually became distant from the original Paleo-Hebrew that I'm talking about here. And the ancient Hebrew letters were found in the Moabite stone uh, and, and continued to be used till about 140 BC. So we know a lot about the ancient Hebrew. And I suspect that it was the original uh, language. In fact, I'll show you reasons why I believe that God gave Moses not just the Torah, but He gave it to him letter by letter. I'll show you why I say that. The Hebrew alphabet is also the only alphabet I'm aware of that is self-parsing. It's very typical it's for ancient writing, especially to be what they call scriptic that the, the, the letters are just written without spaces between the words. And that's very confusing if you're reading Latin, some of the ancient writing, because there's no spaces between the words. We're used to that, but the ancient writing didn't have that. Well, the Hebrew has five of the letters in Hebrew take a different shape if they're the last letter of the word. You follow me? Uh, of a sentence and so on, because it parses them into sentences for you. It's a self-parsing language. And, uh, and that, doesn't, that doesn't come up to me in most discussions unless you happen to be a student of attempts at extraterrestrial communication. But moving on here. 
That turns out to mean that if you play around with Hebrew, Hebrew lends itself to wordplay, um, ac acrostics, puns, uh, transpositions, mysticism, the Kabbalah dwells on some of that. They even have a numerical value for every letter, which means that words have numerical value, and it's astonishing to discover that those are relevant numbers. You take the word for pregnancy, and not, the numbers add up to 271 number of days, nominal days of pregnancy. You take the word for a year, it adds up to 355. Not 360, because it's a lunar year. And so forth. You, you discover that the, num the, the numerical value of the words turn out to have relevance. So that leads to a sense of mysticism that gets exploited by some. Now what that really means then, is the ancient Hebrew sages turned out to be the guys that really developed what we think of today as cryptography, writing secret codes. So the cryptology that developed during the Renaissance especially, all the kings had a staff of people because their livelihood and their success at war and peace depended on being able to communicate secretly or to, un, uh, to, to discover what, how their king, somebody else's. So the whole field of cryptography was behind warfare, especially in World War II, by the way. And uh, so that led, to, you see, the, the specialist skills that were typically Jewish, they typically dominated the staffs of most of the countries throughout the whole Renaissance period, improving and developing very advanced forms of cryptography. And so uh, that leads then, of course, to development of mechanical aids. What emerges during the Renaissance are all kinds of gadgets, little dials and ways to make encrypting a message simpler. But the people that were expert at that turned out to be some of the Jewish geniuses that were behind all that. And the ultimate example of that was when the, the Germans developed these elaborate machines called Enigma. And uh, the, the, a variation of that got to Japan, which we, Enigma was the German version and Purple was the Japanese version of the way they encrypted their messages. Now what the Germans, before the Enigma came out, they had a system, um, well, we had a system called Black. At El Alamein, we discovered that the Germans had discovered our, how to crack our code called Black. And Winston Churchill made the interesting observation that before El Alamein, we never had a victory. After El Alamein, we never had a defeat. The role of cryptography is crucial in the warfare. And that led to two guys, Alan Turning in Britain and John von Norman in the United States that undertook these gigantic intensive programs to try to crack these advanced encryption machines of the enemy. And that's what led to the computer. Most of the computer advances out of World War II came by this intensive effort to try to crack the codes being used by our enemies. And uh, so, that's a whole saga in its own right, but uh, uh, William Friedman was running all over Sunday morning trying to get attention people because they knew about Pearl Harbor coming before it happened because they had cracked the code, but nobody believed him. And we know that story there. But the whole wartime computer development continues after the war, and computers, of course, have become a major information appliance of our day. So that's all news. But that appliance that we now take advantage of has caused us to discover things that the ancient Hebrew sages knew thousands of years before. And uh, so, there's a guy by the, by the uh, young man uh, by the name of Weissmandel. At the age of 13, he acquired a commentary by one of the ancient rabbis, Baca ben Asher. And he was fascinated by having stumbled on these notes by this ancient Hebrew sage because he kept making cryptic asides about how important it is to skip certain letters. And that fascinated him. So he actually took the 304,000 letters of the Torah and he wrote them out on 10 by 10 cards, which is a typical way to try to unscramble some of that. Now his, his, his researches were interrupted by the war years, because he got involved obviously in all, in, in all that traffic. But he discovered, or I should say he rediscovered, what we call today the equidistant letter sequences. Now ELSs, equal equidistant letter sequences, are 
not a very sophisticated form of encryption. In fact, it's a very unsatisfactory form of encryption. It's really a fabulous way of what's called authentication. And we'll take a look at that as we go here. And uh, Rabbi Michael Bear, um, uh, Weissmandel had discovered, it, he didn't, he really rediscovered something the ancient rabbis knew, and I want to show you one of the things that he discovered to give, and it, what we're going to see today in large measure is really from his legacy for us. So let's take a look at this. He noticed that Rabbi Michael Menasher said, the secrets of the Torah are revealed in the skipping of the letters. Now, what does that mean? That's kind of an invitation to, to spend some time, okay? And so, uh, and that was in the 13th century that he did this. That's a long time ago. And so, let's take a look at the book of Genesis. And this is in the Hebrew, bear with me. And remember, though, that Hebrew goes from right to left. English goes from left to right. So from our point of view, it's going backwards, but bear with me here. And what I'm showing you is, was first showed to me by um, Dr. Gerald Schroeder, who is a world-famous nuclear physicist, but he resides in Jerusalem, and I had the privilege of spending Passover with him, and we're good friends. And he was the one that showed me this, but it's common knowledge to a serious Hebrew scholar. But if you take the book of Genesis, and you go to the, <clears throat> there are four letters we're going to watch for what we would call a T-O-R-H, a Tau, Vav, Resh, and He. And you go to the first T equivalent, the first Tau, you count 49 letters, you get to the Vav. And then from the Vav, you count 49 letters, you encounter a Resh, okay? From the Resh, you count 49 letters, and you come to a He. You say, well, okay, that's, so what's that? Well, it turns out, a ta, vav, resh, he, spells Torah. Bear in mind, it goes from right to left, we go from left to right. Okay, that's curious that the, the title, so to speak, of the Torah is, is, is in 49 letter intervals in the opening of it. Big deal. So, so what about? Well, you go on to the book of Exodus, you discover the same thing happens. You encounter a tau, and then a vav, and then a resh, and then a he. Again, we have the Torah spelled out in, in Exodus. No, that gets her, that's, that's kind of curious because however unlikely it was for Genesis, for it happening again gets our attention, okay? So we go, uh, Exodus, we get to the book of Numbers. Uh, Leviticus, it doesn't happen, and you almost feel a sigh of relief. When you get to Numbers, you notice something even stranger you find out that the same four letters are found in 49 letter intervals, except they are backwards. It goes, it's Torah spelled backwards. And when you get to Deuteronomy, pretty much the same thing happens. Count 49 letter intervals and you got Torah backwards. Now you stand back from this puzzled, because it's too systematic to be accidental. Somebody somehow arranged it deliberately, it would seem, but very strangely. 49 is 7 squared. In the 49 letter sequences, we have te Genesis Torah, Exodus is Torah. Le Leviticus, that doesn't happen, but Numbers, it goes backwards, and Deuteronomy, it goes backwards. So we go, let's take a second look at Leviticus a little more carefully. Not 49 letters, we'll take the square root, 7 letters, and we'll take a look and see what happens at Leviticus. <coughs> Leviticus. At 7 letter intervals, we discover that it spells out yod heh vav -He. yod heh vav -He, the name, the unpronounceable name of God. So now as we look at the whole design, we see that Exodus and Leviticus go from left to right, Deuteronomy and Numbers go backwards in effect, and Leviticus has yod heh vav -He. In other words, the point is, the Torah always points to yod heh vav -He. Now some people will look at this and say, well that's just a curious accidental arrangement of letters, to which I say nonsense. Let's examine the evidence. This rediscovery by Weismandel appears what we call a remez, a hint of something even deeper. And that's a, a we're going to, let's take a look at some more other examples here. See, Mo Moses and Davis wrote in letters that were very different than, uh, than the letters we wrote. Their tav really looked more like a T. 
Okay, the ta, that was the original. The vav originally looked like a nail. The resh represented the head of a man. The resh represented the head of a man. The he represents the breath. Remember, remember Eliza Doolittle in Pygmalion? In Hartford, Hereford, Hesher, hurricanes hardly happened. She was being instructed not to lose her H's because the H represents a breath. And the He in Hebrew represents the breath or wind or the Spirit of God. When Abraham's name was changed to Abraham, God added one letter in the middle of the name, an H. Sarai became Sarah. The Spirit of God was put in each of them and that caused their name change. Those things are relevant, you see. So, the, what the letters imply in the Paleo-Hebrew, a man with the Spirit of God nailed on the cross. Does that get to you? It does me. But let's move on here. I want to show you something that uh, isn't widely known, strangely enough, but uh, it's a story that puzzles many people. It's in the Bible. That's Genesis 38. Judah's peculiar sin with Tamar. And there are many people that wonder, why is this in the Bible in the first place? You're trying to have a Bible study with your kids and a family, and you get to Genesis 38, and you're not quite sure what to do about it, because it's a sordid tale, where Judah's um, daughter-in-law contrives to get herself pregnant by her father-in-law. And that's in there because it's part of the Messianic genealogy. But it's the kind of story you have a tough time dealing with with small children, right? You have a tough time dealing with adults. Right? So the story of jo Joseph starts in Genesis 30, in uh, chapter 37. And from 37 to 50 is this fantastic finale of the book of Genesis. This incredible career of Joseph. Uh, from, from bondage all the way to being the prime minister of the world. Incredible story. But right as it gets started, you've got this distraction called Genesis 38. What's that all about? We encounter this sordid episode where Judah is tricked into having sex with his daughter-in-law, Tamar, which then gives birth to two sons out of wedlock, two illegitimate sons. They're in the, ge they're in the genealogy of the Messiah, strangely enough. Okay. Why is it here? That's a whole question I'll let you study on your own, but I'll give you one thing, that's, one thing about it being here that most people don't know. So we'll get into this. I discovered this in an article in a proceedings of the Association of Religious Professionals from the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe in Israel, Jerusalem, Israel, and back in 1987. Someone called to my attention, and I have a copy of it, and I was stunned with what it says. You take Genesis 38, and you discover that at 49 letter intervals, you have three letters here that spell Boaz. Well, that's cute. That's curious. Well, again, you find there's three letters at 49 letters intervals that spell, strangely enough, Ruth. Really? Wow. You continue the book of Genesis and you discover at 49 letter intervals, you discover there's three letters that spell out the Obed. Okay? And then you go a little further and you find three letters that spell out Yeshe, or we would say Jesse. Right? And then you find three letters at 49 letter intervals that spell out David. Wait a minute here. Notice what I've just told you. You have in Genesis 38 Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse, David, these are all with 49 letter intervals in chronological order, the family tree of David. And what's startling about this, if you study your Bible, this is in the book of Genesis. It's a long way from Genesis through Exodus, through Joshua, through Judges, through 1 Samuel. You don't have David emerge in the biblical narrative until the second chapter, uh, or seventh chapter of 2 Samuel. And yet, you look back and you see it was here all along. 
And we get this impression that, that uh, Israel wanted a king, and so God let him have king, because they, they pestered him, so he let him have Saul. What we don't understand, God had his king in the wings for the right time. They want a king, I'll teach them a little bit about king. I'll let this big, tall, super guy show them what kings are all about. It's called taxes, and what have you. So you get a different perspective of God. God knows what he's doing, and he had it planned all before. These people that teach that, you know, God was sort of his reluctant concession to give Israel a king because he insisted on it, doesn't tell the whole story. But here we are. And so, it's interesting. This is encrypted in the book of Genesis. And people say, well, gee, it, 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 uh, it, the, the Hebrew tends to lend itself to wordplay. It lends itself to these kind of games. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, turn that around. Is it possible that Hebrew was designed to make this wordplay possible? If you realize that, you begin to realize that God must have given Moses the Torah letter by letter. Why? Because these things I've just showed you, you take one letter out of the picture and it falls apart. Wow! Wow, wow, wow. And so, the design of the Hebrew alphabet is unique. It's semimic, not just phonetic. The letters carry meaning. And so that lends itself to all. You are holding in your lap with a Bible a supernatural book, a book that came from outside our terrestrial environment, outside time. It writes history before it happens. And when you discover that for yourself, it'll change your entire life. You'll treat it with respect. In fact, the right word is awe as you begin to understand what you've got here. When you get to the little book of Ruth, which is one of my favorites, and I won't try to, I try not to get derailed here and get into this too much, but in this, it, it, the Ruth ends up in the big climactic, in chapter four, the final chapter, the big wrap up is when Boaz takes Ruth to wife, and the, the kinsman redeemer takes a Gentile bride, and they have the marriage, and you get to verse 12 of chapter four, and somebody says, and let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. Now I used to think that sounds like a toast at a wedding or something, you know, may your house be like Pharaoh's, which if you know Genesis 38, you'd say to the guy, same to you, fella. You want my family tree to be like Tamar's with two illegitimate, you know, it's not a toast at a wedding. It's a prophecy by a prophet. May your, let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh's whom Tamar bare unto Judah. Wow, you gotta be kidding, that's a pretty strange story. Of the seed which the Lord shall give of thee of the young woman. See, the piece of knowledge that you have to have to understand, the book of Ruth is a treasure, but you need to know three or four critical laws operative in ancient Israel. The law of redemption, the law of Leverite marriage, there's several of those, law of gleaning. There's another one. In Deuteronomy 23, 2 it says, a bastard, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. So they have a requirement in the genealogy in Israel that if there's an illegitimate soil, it takes ten generations to purge that. You follow me there? That's a, well, a relatively uh, unknown thing. Well, from Perez, let's count. Perez, Hezron, Ram, Amminadab, Nashon, Salmon, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, David, David. David was the tenth generation after Perez. This prophecy in the book of Ruth, which again is a book from the time of the judges, long before David, obviously, but has appended to it the genealogy so you understand what's really going on here. Ooh, wow. And of course, you recognize those last four are the ones that are encrypted in the book of Genesis 38 the very thing we're talking about here. Do you see this tied together? Do you see the design that's going on here? Amazing. There's another thing in Jew Jewishness that you and I as Gentiles probably are not aware of. That's what they call the appointed times. It all comes out of Leviticus 23. They, uh, Rabbi Hirsch uh, uh, is famous for saying the Jews' catechism is his calendar. If you want to understand Jewishness, the place you start is to really understand the Jewish calendar. And uh, so, they have a heptatic calendar, it's on the basis of sevens. There's a week of seven days, and we all know that about Shabbat. There's a week of weeks, with Shavuot is a week of weeks, 
We have the week of months, that's the religious year, which goes from, the, 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 the civil year goes from Tishri, you know, around, and, and uh, the religious year goes from uh, um, Nisan around. And uh, then they have a week of years. They actually have a week of years, the sabbatical year. The, the ground was supposed to rest one year and seven, and so on. And they have seven weeks plus one, that's called the Jubilee year. Seven weeks of years and one. It's Jubilee year. Where all land reverts to its owners, all slaves go free, all debts are forgiven, and that it's the time of the restitution of all things. In Acts 3.21, Peter uses that phrase to talk about the second coming. So it deserves some attention. But in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, there's a very interesting verse. It's part of the Genesis, you know, day one situation. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days, and years. You all remember that from Genesis 1? For seasons, that's in the English. In the Hebrew, that's the Hamoyedim. The appointed times is what it really says, okay? Now it turns out that there are appointed times in the Hebrew calendar. There are 52 Sabbaths, we know Shabbat, that's Saturday, right? Um, there are also, though, seven other high, uh, 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 Sabbaths. There are seven days of Passover, when you include the related festival days of uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of uh, First Fruits. You have Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, and uh, we have uh, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. You have seven days of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and you have that final day at the end, Shimi Atzeret, the eighth day of assembly. Every Jew knows of these 70 appointed times. Are you with me? But there's something very interesting here. Hamoyadim, the appointed times. If you look for it as an equidistant letter sequence, ask the computer to find that for me in the book of Genesis, the equidistant letter sequence, it appears only once in Genesis. The statistical expectation from the statistics of the letters involved, you'd expect it to show up probably five times in the 78,000 letters of Genesis. That's, if you know how frequently those letters show up, and you know how uh, many uh, letters you got, you can make a guess at what you would expect it to be, more or less, the statistics. But you discover something very strange. It only appears once. That, uh, to a statistician, catches your attention. That's surprising. Somebody has diddled with this a little bit. And it's the interval that it shows up at is 70. Really? That, is that a coincidence? Possibly. And it's centered on the very verse we're talking about. Genesis 1.14. The odds against this happening just by chance have been estimated at greater than 70 million to one. So this is not a likely occurrence. It's something that if you're a, 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 a looking at it scientifically, it causes your attention. It's an indication that the text appears to have been diddled with. All right? The word Israel. How does it show up? In the first 10,000 letters of Genesis, and looking at intervals from minus 100 to plus 100, minus being going backwards, you go looking at both ways, it only appears twice. What? In 10,000 it only appears twice, and the intervals are 7 and 50. Wow. The Kudush, every Saturday night, the Sabbath observance, Genesis 1 through 31 to the end, they, they go through the Kudush. And, uh, that's a, and then they have the Jubilee year after seven Shemitahs plus one, Leviticus 25. The seven and 50 that gets the attention of anyone that's Jewish. Let's talk about trees in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, it starts at the end of chapter 1 and folds over in chapter 2. You have, God said, Behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is on the face of the earth, every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, and it and to you it shall be for meat, and goes on, and it finishes up in the next, at the beginning of the next chapter, where it says, uh, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, and good, good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So from Genesis 1.29 to Genesis 2.9, we have some text, right? In that text is encrypted all of the 25 trees that show up in the Bible. You got to be kidding. No. The tamarisk, the terebinth, the thicket, the citrus, etc., acacia, almond, wheat, date, palm, set, uh, the cedar, the aloe, the grape, 
the box horn of Bramble, the cassia, the poplar, and uh, a whole bunch of others. There are 25 trees. When you see a minus number, it means it's in there backwards, but the point, they're encrypted in those few verses. 25 trees that show up in your Bible are tucked away here as a reference point. Just by accident, just the accident of language? I don't think so. I don't think so. Something occurred back in 1994 that was absolutely impossible to explain. It created quite a turmoil. Doran Whitsum, Elihu Rips, and Johav Rosenberg, they observed a phenomenon and they submitted the phenomenon to a peer reviews journal called Statistical Science. And what they noticed that third, they made a list of 34 of the most prominent rabbis in Jewish history. They had their dates of birth and the dates of death. And all of them were found in the Bible encrypted with those dates of birth and death. The, the, uh, the statistical estimates were made at like in 1 in 75, 775 million. The Statistical Review Board thought it was contrived. They said, let's add another 32 rabbis to your list. So they took another 30, they took the 34, they added 32 additional ones and ran through it. They also had their birth and deaths associated statistically in the biblical text. Now this created quite a stir. It was too bizarre to ignore, but no way to explain that. It took six years of scientific back and forth review until the article was finally actually accepted for the, this prestigious journal called Statistical Science. It gets better than that. The big guns in cryptography got interested in this. Dr. Harold Gans was the senior mathematician for the National Security Agency, if you know what the NSA is. It's the super science of cryptography, always has been. Dr. Harold Gans is their number one hero. He decided to take the t thing they found and do it himself on his personal computer. It took 440 hours of crunching the numbers, 19 days. And he felt there's less than one chance in 62,500 that it was due to chance. He not only authenticated what they did, he quit his job at the NSA and now teaches the Torah in Jerusalem. Wow. <laughs> all eight referees, all eight referees of the statistics, the, the skeptics that were on the statistics uh, uh, journal, uh, after six years review, they all became believers in the codes, interestingly enough. They had the Holocaust codes they found. Hitler in Deuteronomy 10, Auschwitz, Holocaust, and these are all in Deuteronomy, the Holocaust, uh, crematorium for my sons in Poland, the plagues, the Fuhrer, Eichmann is even in there, King of Nazis, genocide, Auschwitz, Germany, Hitler, Mein Kampf, they even have, uh, it goes on and on about Zyklon B and other stuff. So the exploitation begins. Now you start seeing books being written. One of the most famous, Michael Drazen wrote a book called The Bible Code, published in 1997. They claim to predict Rabin's assassination. He uses some contrived translations, some very specious mathematics. He's not a believer, but his book stirred a lot of people to get interested in it. If you want some more decent books on the subject, Jeffrey Satinover's book, Cracking the Bible Code, is not bad. He's Jewish and has at least some, uh, some background here. And John Weldon, de uh, Decoding the Bible Code, Can We Trust the Message by Harvest House. And John Ankerberg was on our board and back in those days and so forth, too. Well, along the way, as all this furor is going, a guy raises his hand and says, gee, if they're so interesting, what about Yeshua? And uh, that was a dear friend of ours, Yaakov Ramsel. We became very, very good friends. And if you're familiar with some of my materials, I, uh, he's, he, he's, he pointed me in a number of provocative discoveries. He passed away a few months ago. He operated out of San Antonio, Texas. Both he and Grant, Jeff Grant Jeffrey and I both are very indebted to Yaakov and some of his discoveries about Yeshua and the, what we call the Yeshua codes. Now, interesting that Yeshua is made up of four letters that have rel the relatively high frequency letters. And uh, 
The word Yeshua appears over 5,500 times in the Old Testament. No surprise, Jesus said the volume of the book is written of me, didn't he, right? Okay. Uh, uh, and he says that in Psalm 40, and, and anyway. He also searched the scriptures, they are, uh, they are written of me. Jesus says that. Now, if you take a look at the frequency tables of, G of Hebrew cryptography, the frequency of those letters are tabulated, so you can estimate the frequency that a certain, how often a certain word might appear. And uh, th that's a useful tool in all of that. Now, to depart from this turns out to violate a law called Ziff's Law, the, uh, the uh, principle of least effort. And there's a whole discussion, we can get into that if you like. I don't want to derail this too much in that there, except to point out that uh, you're dealing with frequency tables with the alphabet that's even shorter, which makes things occur more often. And so the Yeshua codes. In Genesis 1-1, we find Yeshua is Abel. In Genesis 3.27, Adam and Eve are covered. Josiah, he will save. Ruth opens up with a five uh, interval sequence, Yeshua. Uh, Daniel 9. See, all the major prophecy passages is are littered with these Yeshua codes too. So those are encouraging. But let's take a look at Isaiah 53. What do we find in Isaiah 53? Well, Yeshua is my name. That's interesting. His signature. The Messiah. Nazarene, that's an interesting word, Galilee, Shiloh, Pharisee, the Levites, Caiaphas, Annas, both of them, the hereditary one, Annas, and his, the, the Roman appointee, are both were at the cross at 53. The Passover was the time. The man Herod was one of the principles. The wicked Caesar Parish is in there. The evil Roman citizen, let him be crucified. Moriah, uh, the cross, Pierce, from the, from the atonement lamb, bread, wine, Obed, Jesse, seed, water, and Jonah, strangely enough. You say, well, that's kind of interesting, but that still doesn't, you know, doesn't rattle my cage more. Stand by. You ready for this? Okay. What else you find in Isaiah 53? The disciples mourn. And we find the name Peter, Matthew, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, James, twice, Mary three times, Salome, Joseph, Simon, Thaddeus, Matthias. You find those that are at the foot of the cross encrypted, all of them, in these 12 verses called Isaiah 53. Wow, let's take a look at these here. The name Peter, Kepha appears in Isaiah 53, beginning with the second letter of the fifth word, and counting every nineteenth letter right to left. With over 300 occurrences in the book of Isaiah, this incident in isolation wouldn't seem that important. But it's the coincidence that keep piling up. Um, <clears throat> we go to Matthew. Beginning at the first letter of the twelfth word, we find Matthew with 295 letters to the right. The name of Johan. Uh, is also appears in Isaiah 53, 10, starting with the fourth letter and the eleventh word and counting every twenty-eighth letter to the right. Now this is more significant since this code appears only nine times in the entire book of Isaiah. There are some other aspects to the specific location that we'll mention here shortly. The name of Andrew appears in Isaiah 53, 4, beginning at the first letter of the eleventh word and counting every eight, uh, forty-eighth letter to the, from, right to, from left to right, in reverse in other words. And since there are only such five occurrences in the entire book of Isaiah, its appearance compounds the evidence against this all just occurring by unaided chance alone. Something's going on here. We have Philip in the passage. There are only 15 such appearances in the entire book of Isaiah. Its inclusion in this cluster then adds additional weight to the inference of deliberate design. Then we get to Thomas. He appears in Isaiah in the second verse, starting with the first letter in the eighth word and counting every thirty-fifth letter from le right to left. There are over two hundred appearances of this code in the book of Isaiah, so in isolation this doesn't seem that compelling. But again, being clustered with all the others seem to be rising above any what we would call a residual noise level. Something's going on here. And then we have the name James, the English equivalent of Yaak Yaakov, if you will, or the Hebrew Yaakov. Uh, appears twice behind the text at intervals of minus 20 and minus 34. And uh, so it was a very common name in that period. 
What makes this provocative is that there were apparently two Jameses present at the cross, not three. One of them did not become a believer until after the resurrection. So there were apparently two at the cross, and there are two Jameses in Corinth, not three, in effect. So you with me? Okay. One of the, see, one of these Jameses was the son of Zebedee, the brother of John, whom he's called by Jesus one of the twelve. Remember, the sons of thunder they were called. Very prominent in the list of twelve. And clearly on the inside circle, along with Peter, they were present when Jesus raised the uh, Jairus' daughter at the Transfiguration and at the uh, confidential briefing of the Second Coming called the Olivet Discourse. And they were with Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane. These three were very, very prominent. And James was among the first martyrs by decapitation at the command of Herod Agrippa I. The other James was the son of Alphaeus, another of the twelve apostles. He is usually identified as James the Younger. Now it's interesting that the name James appears only twice. The third James apparently was not present at the cross. He was the Lord's half-brother who along with his brothers Joseph, Simon, and Judas apparently did not accept the authority of Jesus before the resurrection. After the risen Jesus had appeared to him, he became a leader of the Jewish Christian church at Jerusalem. Very, very prominent in our early history. So it's interesting that there aren't three Jameses on the list. A few years later, by the way, James suffered martyrdom by stoning at the instigation of the high priest Annas at the interregnum after the death of the procurator Festus in AD 61. That's all in Josephus if you want to look it down. Okay, now we have three Marys. One of the three is encrypted in such a way that it interleaves with Johann, John, interestingly enough. And uh, so all three Marys use the letter Yod in the word uh, Yarik, uh, and this is the same letter Yod that appears in the first letter of the coded names Yeshua and John. It is this intimate interlinking of three Marys with both Ye Yehoshua and Johann that is striking. They're encrypted as a cluster, if you will. And of course you've got some others here, so, so it's a... There are over 40 relevant names in 15 sentences. It's the density of those references and the relevance to the plain text. Now these are the codes lying underneath the plain text, what's called plain text in the, in, the, in the craft here. It is the density and the relevance of the plain text that would seem to defy attribution to unaided random chance alone. To suggest that this just happened by random chance is really to deny the evidence. And uh, so, it's the apologetic implications of this that st I find staggering. Quite apart from the devotional aspects, the apologetic. The fact that this is a characteristic of the text is staggering in its implications. But we've gone from just some interesting references to the twelve that were twelve apostles. There's one that's, there's another discovery that I think is more compelling than anything I've shown you so far. Are you ready for this? Okay. Before I get into this, I want you to ask this, answer this question. Let's just table what we've said. I want to pause here. Can you tell me what's peculiar about the following text? I'm going to put something on the screen here for you to read. It's a, just a piece of text, not biblical, just a piece of text. Upon this basis, I'm going to show you how a bunch of bright young folks did find a champion. A man with boys and girls of his own. A man of so dominating and happy individuality that youth is drawn to him as is a fly to a sugar bowl. It is a story about a small town. It's not a gossipy yarn, nor is it a dry, monotonous account full of such customary fill-ins as romantic moonlight casting murky shadows down a long, windy country road. And this goes on. I'll give you another one. It goes, it goes on. Nor will it say anything about the twinklings lulling distant foals or robins caroling at twilight, nor any warm glow of lamplight from a cabin window. No, it is an account of an up-and-going activity, a vivid portrayal of youth as it is today, and a practical discarding of that worn-out notion that a child don't know anything. Okay, it's just a piece of text, and you're just an analyst looking at, at that piece of text. Did you notice, anybody notice anything unusual about it? Anyone want to hazard a guess what's unique about this? You've got it. One person got it. Good for you. There are no E's in it. This is a text without an E's. Well, you say, so what? Wait a minute now. 
E is the most high frequency letter in English. Now what this is, this is an excerpt of uh, E's occur in English about 13% of the time. That's what called Samuel Morris when he designed his Morse code to make E just a dot and a T a dash because they're the two most common letters in English. And what this is all, what I've taken here, what's the chance that the previous paragraph happened by accident? None. Why? Because it was taken, get this, from a 267 page novel called Gatsby, a story of over 50,000 words without using the letter E, published in 1939 by Ernest Vincent Wright. Now, he just did this as a project, a self-imposed challenge, but he wrote a 50,000 word novel, and he could not use these words. He could not use the word the, he, she, they, we, me, or them. He couldn't use the indispensable words like are, have, were, be, been, or such basic words as there, these, those, when, then, more, after, very. In other words, he actually had to tie down the E on his typewriter to try to make sure that he didn't accidentally use an E. He just decided to try to do that and he pulled it off. Now it's not a great novel, I'm not suggesting you go out and buy one and read it, but, it's, but it's a, it was an interesting uh, data point to understand when you start diddling with the frequency of letters, it's not trivial. That was an enormous job for him to try to do it without the E, okay? The thing that's astonishing to me about Isaiah 53 are not the names that are listed there. there. From a study of the Hebrew frequency tables, there is another name that should occur in Isaiah 53, even by accident. The name Judas does not appear. And those letters are so high frequency, it's non-appearance to me as a cryptologist is more provocative than the ones that are there. This omission is, is, a, is as much or maybe even more significant than is the other inclusions. Judas is made up of very common letters. These letters appear over 50 times in Isaiah, but it does not appear in Isaiah 53. But by the way, his replacement does. Matthias is there. Wow, wow is right, Gene. Exactly. Wow is my reaction too. You can't convince me this wasn't deliberate design by the author. And it wasn't the author of Isaiah. It's, you know, it, the author of, you know, how does all this happen is my question to you. David Cashman, chairman of the Department of Mathematics at Harvard, set it up and he says, the phenomenon is real. What it means, of course, is up to the individual. So we could spend a lot of time on the details. I've tried to get through this highly technical topic in a way that wouldn't uh, you know, bore you if you're not really a cryptologist in the first place. Um, I've written a text which has become somewhat the definitive text in, in biblical cryptology called Cosmic Codes, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity. And the first part of the book is tutorial, just the background of cryptography so you can understand the rest of it. And of 25 chapters, only three are on ELSs. When people say Bible codes, they usually mean ELSs. They're not the most interesting ones. I deal with them because people expect me to. But the other codes that are in there are vastly more uh, uh, staggering in their implications. And you don't need a computer for them. No, I think what we need to do today is simply set aside the details and set aside the controversies. And let's just stand in awe of a majestic and inscrutable Lord. A God that created the universe in the first place. A God that decided to enter his creation as a man, to fulfill our destiny for us. The phenomenon is real. What it means is up to the individual. But I believe there's no way any of this could have been construed from inside our time domain. It came from outside. There's lots I could include in the bibliography. I've mentioned a few, but the, probably the primary one, if you're interested in the subject, I encourage you to take a look at a book. This was, all of this was excerpted out of a book that I published back originally in 1999 and reprinted again in 2004 called Cosmic Codes, Hidden Messages from the Edge of Eternity. And it goes into not just the ELSs, but uh, 
the other codes that are the microcodes and the macrocodes, both of which are very different, vastly more uh, impacting in my view. So I'll let you discover that on your own. In the meantime, as a session of our commentary on Isaiah, what I'd like you to do for the next session is read ahead now from chapters 54 through 59. I'm not sure how many of those you'll be able to attack, but we'll try to make up some time here as we move our way uh, through Isaiah to the, the big news, the kingdom that's coming uh, downstream here. So with that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We stagger as we discover its nuances, the many ways that it points to your majesty. Awesome, awesome treasure that you've given us. We pray, Father, through your Holy Spirit, you'd open our hearts and lives to what you have here for us, that we would try to understand the extremes you've gone to on our behalf, that we might appropriate to ourselves these incredible blessings that you've gone to such extremes to provide to us. We thank you for that, and we implore you to take us without any reservation. We commit ourselves into your hands. In the name of Yeshua, our Lord indeed. Amen.